Jacobin, I really appreciate your, uh, you making your, your time available um, for a couple of minutes to tell us about uh, simulation and your kind of uh, journey so far. Um, but maybe just as, as, as an introduction, give us a two-minute overview of your career since you graduated. Yeah, you finished a master's degree in the meantime as well. So what, what led you to today? Okay, thanks, John. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so during my studies, I was lucky enough to get a bursary from one of the largest diversified mining companies, BHU Billiton, as they were called back then. So I was able to do my final year project at the Samanco Manganese Smelter in Meijerton called Metalloys. And my final year project was to simulate the impact of a new furnace on the raw material transport system. Um, and this is my first real taste of a real life simulation project and I was completely hooked. I just, just wanted to do simulation. So after my studies, I was lucky enough to go and work with BHP for the next five years. Had a couple of simulation projects. It wasn't my main focus, um, but I had the opportunity to go and work um, in Australia on three months on probably the biggest supply chain, uh, mining supply chain project that I've ever heard of. Um, and my work at the smelter, there was a few a specific simulation projects, but a lot of it was more like just understanding the processes, doing reporting, typical Excel um, modeling. But I got to spend a lot of time on, on the factory floor, understanding how does production work, how does it integrate with maintenance. And I still believe to this day that this is a fundamental requirement for being an engineer, and specifically an industrial engineer, where you typically are slightly more uh, separated from the day-to-day -day processes on the floor, depending on what industry you're in. So. Um, I also did a couple of larger long-term strategy projects when I, worked, when I was at head office, and this really gave me this encompassing view of the entire supply chain, which is just really, really good. And then in 2016, I joined Goldrat Research Labs, working directly under Dr. Alan Barnard, uh, one of the direct students of the late Dr. Eli Goldrat, the founder of Theory of Constraints. And then my responsibility, which is the current position that I'm holding, is to focus on the use of simulation and technology to help our customers make better, faster decisions when it really matters. Um, and simulation is one of these tools that we use to, to help our customers make better decisions, provide them with decision support tools. And this has given me amazing opportunities to travel the globe, work with some incredible companies, steel manufacturers in India, uh, plant in France, producing chicken nuggets for McDonald's, book publishing in, in America. We also had this opportunity to present a lot of these projects at the annual Enelogic and TOC and other conferences. All right. Okay, so simulation now is a, a major part of your of your day-to-day -day career as well. So, so why simulation? What's the value of simulating a scenario? Um, yeah, yeah. How would you explain that? So simulation is incredibly valuable, especially in today's interconnected and, and complex worlds because if you use it correctly it can provide you with three very important um, objectives. It can consider all the critical system interdependencies, the constraints, the complexities and, and just the whole interconnectedness of, of systems which you can't typically do in static support tools like an Excel spreadsheet or ERP systems. And it can also provide you a range of outcomes for a single scenario. So you can do sensitivity analysis, Monte Carlo simulations, and just plain scenario comparisons. And then probably the biggest benefit of simulation, and you'll hear this word a lot um, if you get into the industry about digital twins, right? You need a low risk, low cost way to test the impact of any change on your system, both on the operational and financial metrics. And are normally making these changes in the real world, like building a new furnace or changing your product mix or finding a new distributor can be really time consuming to see what the eventual impact would be, or it can be too um, costly, or there might even be a risk, a safety risk or a risk to your finances, operational, or even your reputation. And, and simulation is able to give you the space where you can test this safely. Do you think you can mess up simulation? <clears throat> if you uh, kind of if you just know enough to get yourself in trouble in simulation do you, do you have experience of that or kind of stories about where that actually happened not necessarily where you were involved but um, because also uh, think it's important to understand that simulation is not a silver bullet one mm -hmm. one can get it wrong yes definitely and I think like any tool you need to really understand 
what it is designed for, what it's used for. And I always like this analogy of saying, if all you have is a hammer, um, every problem looks like a nail, right? So not simulation is not the answer to all your problems. Simulation is time consuming. It is it is costly. You require a lot of in-depth knowledge because if you just simulate at a too high level where your, your question or the changes you want to make requires a considerable amount of detail, you will not get the right answer, right? So I think it's one of those tools in your toolbox. And in our toolbox, it's one of the major tools that we're really specialized in. But we also know that for some tools, you for some problems, you need a different tool, right? So we've solved some other problems using just pure data analytics, right? I never even open up our simulation tool or any logic. I just open up R. And some things is, is easier solved with uh, with a more simple tool, even Excel, for example. So if you use it wrong, you can definitely mess it up. And I mean, if I just look at my models from earlier days where I spent a lot of time doing things, you know, trying to do the right things, but in the wrong way, um, you to spend a lot of time and, and wasted probably a lot of time on a very costly solution where you could have done it better or easier in, in another tool even. All right. Just, I mean, in industrial engineering here at the university, we try not to be too prescriptive in terms of, of simulation tools itself. But um, I mean, I, I know you guys are working in any logic um, as well. And, and the reason that we chose any logic is just because we can expose students to a variety of modeling paradigms. At, at postgraduate level, we look at uh, agent based modeling and system dynamics. Um, but at undergraduate level, we mainly focus on the more traditional discrete event simulation. Um, and, and that is our reason. Why did you guys, um, or what is the advantage for you in terms of using any logic as, as a software, specific software tool? Right. So I think when you get to, okay, um, use simulation, I'm going to use a hammer, right? There's different kinds of hammers. There's a sledgehammer, there's a small hammer, there's big hammers. And any logic provides you this platform. You can say, okay, I've got something agent based. I've got uh, system dynamics. I've got more the process centric, like discrete event type simulations. And you can do all of this within the one tool. But for me, the biggest benefit in having built really complex models is the fact that we say it's, it's underlying language is Java. So there's a lot of things where I say, listen, I'm, I'm just going to use some Java programming to do exactly what I want. I'm not going to use any of the pre-configured objects that's available. So I'm just going to use Java. And as soon as you open up that world, suddenly you can do anything. And any logic provides you this nice front end to say, I'm going to write a little program in Java, and I'm just going to hit export, and I'll give it as a standalone app to the, to the customer to use. Where if you want to build a little Java app and you have to do it in Eclipse and you have to export it and you need to compile it and it, it becomes really tricky. So that's another added tool that they don't really always talk about at, at the conferences, but just to say like, you know, it, you can actually just use it to write a little Java program. And then you get the added benefit of saying in any logic. And I mean, we've been using any logic for years now. So we've got our own library. We even have a public library that people can go and buy and there's a free version to use as well the material design library, which helps you build better looking models. And we've got our own libraries for internal use. We've got a supply chain library. So we get to reuse all the work that we've done in previous projects for the next project. And any logic really makes that a lot easier to do. Right, cool stuff. So my final question would be, what skills should industrial engineering students and young engineers focus on um, that are not necessarily part of, of the undergraduate curriculum? So what skills do you wish you had more of when you kind of entered the, the industry or entered your, your current position? No, that's, that's a very good question. And, and the problem with the answer is that the thing that I wish I had more of is not something I could readily gain while being a student. And that is people skills, right? So you get to learn all these fantastic analytical things and solution methodologies and even presenting. But when you get to the real life, environment now you have to go and ask somebody for help you have to ask them how does this go how does this work etc and the, you can only do that during your undergrad if you start working so that's why vacation work your final year projects all of these things are super important but while you're still in a safe environment you can go and make mistakes you can go and ask people you can go and, and learn these tools so that's definitely something that i would say um, is, is something that if you get the opportunity, put your hand up and say, I want to do this project. I want to work with new people. I want to learn something new. Um, and then the biggest thing is that if you start gaining or more experience working with other people is to ask for feedback. Ask your friend, your colleagues, um, a trusted mentor, like, how am I doing? Am I, am I working correctly with these people? Am I asking the right things? Am I being considerate about their cultures, their languages, their backgrounds, etc.? 
because that's one of the big things that I learned. And luckily, as part of the BHP program, the, um, the engineering and training program, is we had these sessions where we would provide each other feedback and the coaches would provide us feedback. And you suddenly realize, wow, I've got all of these blind spots. And the only time you can really improve it is, is when somebody tells you about it, right? Otherwise, you, you won't be even be able to manage it. So that's really key. Like the people skills is the one aspect that's unfortunately not part of a, any official curriculum that I know of, at least. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's what I typically refer to as your assumed reality. It's a very small view that you have on, on, on the real world out there. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's our ignorance is unfortunately kind of uh, problematic. I want to just revert back to, to one thing <clears throat> that you kind of highlighted. Um, and it's just because I know that the people that you collaborated with in Australia are also South Africans, and they are former students of industrial engineering. Um, so that kind of just brought up the question, how would you rate the South African degree, and specifically University of Pretoria Industrial Engineering um, degree, in terms of making you presentable on the, on the international stage? I think it's, it's great. It's, it's on par there with the international standards. But it is, I think, it depends a lot on who you are and what you make of it, right? You can get two guys with exactly the same degrees from exactly the same university, completely different work ethic, completely different sort of retained knowledge of what they learned. They didn't you know, dive deep into it and make the knowledge their own. So to me, it's really, it doesn't really matter where, where you studied or what degree you've got. It's all about what you make of it. But in terms of just the actual degree and the stuff that, that we learned at UP and what I've seen the other guys do and... And, and being an exter uh, external examiner for the final year projects, I really can relate and say that it is on par with the rest of the world. Great stuff. Jakobin, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your wisdom and sharing your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if anybody wants to connect, I'm on LinkedIn and happy to chat if they've got any further questions. Thanks so much, Johan, for having me. Jakobin Fosler, thank you so much.